Welcome everyone who's here today. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Ana Jaramillo and I'm joined here today by Bruce Olson. We're gonna be showing um, uh, uh, a short demonstration of ease five, uh, the current edition. We're gonna be using uh, 5.64. If you have already downloaded, that's the current version. And we're gonna be showing you just a couple of the features coming up as well. Uh, this is intended to be a demonstration of the software's capabilities uh, rather than a workshop. So we, we are not planning on going at a pace where you can follow on your own uh, computers. Uh, so we invite you to just um, watch what we're showing. Uh, this webinar uh, will be posted to our YouTube channel at some point and you can rewatch later as well. Uh, we will have uh, questions uh, or time for questions after, after every section, but uh, you can use the Q&A um, button at the bottom of the screen at any time to add your questions. And, um, and you can use the chat as well to, to greet and, and to add any general comments as well. So what we're gonna be covering today is a brief introduction and overview um, of the uh, interface of the program and main features. Uh, then we're gonna do an exercise about how to draw a room, adding materials, sources, receivers, uh, all the basics of putting a room together. Then we'll go into uh, some things that apply mostly to the sound system design um, side of things. Uh, and then lastly, to acoustical uh, room design tools. So let us go directly into ease now. Some windows out of the way here. And I'm going to open my first project is gonna be a theater. So, um, I'm gonna be showing you the interface and then we'll go into the project. Uh, so when we first open Ease, we get these two main windows, the 3D view and the project's property. So one of the first things we do when we start a project is we add a name, an author, any remarks that seem important, for example, uh, drawn from drawings or tuned from measurements or you know important dates, Especially if you're collaborating with other people, it's important to keep track of those things too. So any, any notes that you think are important, you can add here. Um, from this first menu, uh, the file menu, we can see that we can load drawings. In this case, we have already loaded them, uh, uh, but that's where we would load other ones. So it would basically just take us to select any image files that we have there. And then other than that, we can start new, we can open a new project and um, yeah, actually let me click yes so I can show you uh, the types of projects that you can open. It can be an ES5, an ES4 project or even CAD models. So if you're starting from a DWG that you saved out of AutoCAD or SketchUp or Revit or any program, then you can do it that way. And then if we click add, it'll be the same as opening, but then instead of replacing what we have here, it'll add additional content. So maybe you um, add several floors of the same project that you had as separate files or changes that you work um, externally with SketchUp or with another program. Um, under surfaces, we have everything that's related to creating the geometry of the room adding faces, editing the vertices of those faces, adding materials and things like that. Under loudspeakers, we will have our sources. Um, so we can add um, different sources, a talker, uh, an omni source or a specific loudspeaker model that we have. Under receivers, I'm gonna do this because the zoom window keeps getting on top of me. There we go. So on the receivers, uh, we can add audience areas and listener seats, and we're gonna see what uh, we use those for later. Uh, tools will give us um, 
like the name implies, uh, tools for editing, for changing things, moving things, uh, storing groups, um, all, all of those things, as well as uh, saving information uh, as pictures out of this mod module. Uh, we'll go into some of the calculations later. So this is where we choose some of those calculation modules. Uh, Windows will help us reconfigure our layout and we're going to be opening and closing different windows as well through the exercises we do today. And then finally, the presentation will give us uh, the different ways of viewing the room. So for example, we can turn drawings on and off. Uh, we can go into um, different, well, when we have the geometry into different uh, ways of seeing the room and, and so on. Uh, so hopefully we'll be using most of those tools uh, through today. And uh, let's get started with the current project. So this is a theater. Like I said, we already have some drawings added. These are 2D drawings that will help us draw the initial uh, geometry of the room. So I'm going to choose a polygon. And then uh, I can use some shortcuts, for example, the X key, to make sure that I'm drawing a straight line down the X axis. And then continue that way. Here, and then I'm going to go straight from that corner into this corner. Then I'm going to draw the first lanthanide face. So for this one, I'm going to find that corner in the floor. And with the Z key, I'm going to find the height of that point. And then after three points, I'm locked into coplanarity. So I just have to choose the location of the last one. I'm now going to add this face. I can also enter, uh, for example, I see that's nine feet. So I can also just enter the number uh, directly. And then I'm going to say this point is at the same height and close. And then I'm going to use a tool here to duplicate this one. And I'm going to go. 18 feet up. As we can see, there are nine, nine, and nine back there. Now I'm going to draw my side face. So I'm going to start selecting the points that are already there. And then from this corner, again, I want to go straight up and close. Now, as we can see, we need to uh, cut it out for our balcony. So I'm going to go to my side view for that and to a parallel projection. And I'm going to use my polygon in face to cut a hole in that face. And then I just removed that little part. And now I have uh, the actual shape of my face there. Now I'm going to continue adding these faces. So the next one should be here. Now, as you can see, because I'm um, copying things, sometimes they don't coincide perfectly. And we're going to see what happens with that later. Now, the next tool I'm going to use um, is I'm going to select all of that and I'm going to mirror to the other side. And now I'm going to complete the bottom. Back face. The under balcony. And having all those vertices there makes it very quick. Oops, I guess I didn't create that face. Let's add it. Okay. Now we just need to add this face at the front. our ceiling, and the last little bit of ceiling. 
So this was a very quick creation of a full room. Now, uh, the first thing I do for visibility purposes, I can turn my drawings off so I can view the room. And then I'm going to see if I have any holes. So let's see what, what's happening there. I have some faces that seem to have uh, backwards orientation. So that creates some holes. So it was able to guess most of the orientation of my faces. Uh, but the more complex uh, the rooms are, then it starts um, having a hard time figuring out the orientation and I have to turn them around. Because I have some holes, if I go to my acoustic parameters, I see that my volume is shown in red. That means that um, it can't really calculate a volume and it's not going to allow me to go into any calculations. So let's go and fix those holes. I'm going to select this one and invert the face. Then I'm going to go select the next one and invert the face. Now I still have a little one because that's a smaller face. Now it shows a yellow bar. That means that it's approximately close. It's going to allow me to go into the calculations, but it's warning me that it's not perfect yet. Now I'm going to correct that one as well. And now finally we have a green bar. So it can estimate my room perfectly. Now, um, keep in mind that we still have some holes. Technically we have um, uh, kind of a crooked corner here, but it's so small uh, that it doesn't produce any errors. Uh, we can try to fix some of those things. Remember that because it locks us into coplanarity, we won't always be able to fix them perfectly. Uh, but we can straighten things up a little bit that way. Uh, so that's creating the full room. Now um, let's see what happens uh, when we start adding some materials. So my acoustic parameters, I'm now going to lock into the side panel so we can see it. I'm going to shrink this a little bit. And my calculated vibration time, of course, it's uh, nonsense right now. So from our surfaces, I'm going to open my materials in use. And right now, everything in my room is 100% reflective. If I hover over this little icon, it's going to show me the uh, absorption and scattering uh, curves for that material. This is a theoretical default 100% material, 100% reflective material now. Uh, so let's go and find uh, from this generic uh, list. I'm going to add massive construction. And I'm going to change all of them. Uh, so I can, instead of hitting a specific face, I can just uh, apply that paint bucket to my tile at the bottom. And I converted everything from, um, from your uh, default uh, to massive construction. So basically now it's everything is concrete. So it's um, uh, four and a half seconds of reverb. Now it's, you know, realistic, but still not very good for a theater, of course. Um, so we can add some things. Um, let me uh, go to my presentation and I'm going to hide my ceiling just to make it easier to do this. I multiple selected those six faces and let's go and add a material to them. So this is going to be uh, light upholstering. And as you see, we could select the material and apply it or select the faces and then apply the material. Now we have a new tile and 28% of the room is that. And now we came down to a more reasonable uh, reverberation time. So for any material in this list, uh, we also have that uh, hover ability to see the details. At the bottom, you see the reference. Uh, so let's go to some more um, um, actual materials. For example, if I wanted to search for gypsum, we can uh, filter that list that way. And all of these uh, gypsum or plaster gypsum uh, or different configurations, 
come from different references. So uh, Don Davis, Egan, Cyril Harris. Uh, so all of these materials uh, in the current database come from published references, mostly uh, acoustic textbooks. And as you can see, there are 2000 there. So you can find most of your materials. You can also have a custom database. Uh, that's where you add your own materials from projects that, um, that you need to add. So uh, for example, if I search for Teatro, uh, that's gonna show me the materials that I use for a specific project and are under a folder uh, that has that name. So it's able to filter uh, by different tags and, and folders and things like that. Okay, so I'm gonna dock this back behind here. Now we have a wider area. And for now, I'm gonna close my materials in use and I'm gonna show the entire room again. Now, usually uh, we like to go in this order from left to right. So we finish the room. Now we go into loudspeakers. Um, so we're gonna start by adding a talker. Uh, that's a talk box. In this case, the one from Embedded Acoustics. Um, and I can put it somewhere um, in the stage uh, and then I can um, click uh, uh, Z. Uh, to go up and I'm going to add that at 5.5 feet above the stage. Uh, and now if we wanted more precise location, I'm going to open this one again. Uh, then we can see uh, maybe let's make this a precise minus 20 and a precise zero. So now we have the talker at that location. And we can label this, so I'm going to call it talker. So that's a simple box. And now we're going to add uh, an example array. So I'm going to add a line array from FMG. And this time I have the coordinates already calculated, so I'm going to click anywhere. And I'm going to come here and I can use my scroll wheel uh, to move it, or I can enter a precise location. So this one, it tells me that it wants to be at zero, 11 and a half, and 21.5. And as you can see, I was entering decimal feet and it was converting them to feet and inches. Um, you can use either, either option. So now, because it's a line array, we can actually uh, configure it better. So it can give me <laughs> the ability to add more boxes or different frame types. And this all comes from uh, whatever the manufacturer has defined for those devices. So uh, we can maybe go to a side view and decide if we wanted to uh, to tilt some of those boxes. Uh, maybe these ones are the ones that want to cover the bottom. Um, so I can add some uh, additional tilts there. Maybe add one more box. And then cover both the top and the bottom and so on. I'm going to close the configurator again. And now let's add some receivers. Uh, so as I said earlier, we have two types of receivers. We have audience areas. Those are large mapping areas where we're going to have um, uh, mappings for different parameters. Uh, so I'm going to select my top faces and my bottom audience faces. And I'm going to click area above face. So that's going to create six audience areas. We can label them individually. So for example, this one can be main right, main center, main left. And then 
Let me write. Company center. Company left. Now I can also create an audience area for my stage. Uh, maybe I also need to map there. But this one, instead of my uh, sitting ear height, I'm going to set it as audience standing. So as you can see, that's going to be slightly higher. And again, I'm going to label this. I'm going to call it stage. So now I have all my audience areas. And I can also add some listener seats. So listener seats are going to be points where I can create a full response, a full impulse response. Uh, so go more in depth. Uh, so this is the equivalent of adding microphones for measurements in a room. And then we can add some things, for example, uh, a front seat here, maybe a balcony corner, balcony front, or a main back. And again, these ones I can also label. So this is main back. This is on the front, or if you have measurements, maybe you want to label them uh, the the number of your measurement uh, microphone or anything like that. So I just added a few of them. And as you can see, when I enter my speakers, they were all automatically lined up in the uh, horizontal zero that it's always going to be the negative y axis. And uh, opposing to that, every time I enter a seat, by default, it's going to be uh, oriented at 180 degrees. So of course, that's very useful for typical proscenium or uh, throughout stage type of spaces. If we have an arena, then we really don't have that audience um, and stage separation, so we can tilt them in any ways, um, as you can see here. And um, and of course, that orientation is only going to be useful um, when we calculate a few parameters, such as lateral fraction and things that are really um, bilateral. So, but I can still use, um, let me go to my tools. For example, I can calculate the angle for that seat. And I can see in the box there that it's a minus 125.1 in the horizontal. So 125.1 minus, then, then I can make it oriented horizontally towards that. Okay. Let me see. Uh, when we were selecting faces, um, you saw that I had to use an additional key to get inside the room. I'm using the shift key in my scroll to select faces that are inside or behind others. Now, seats and loudspeakers have priority of selection, so I don't have to use anything to select those easily. Let's go back to our acoustic parameters and let's uh, have a final look at what uh, everything else we have here, we already looked at the volume. We can change the air properties if we have something that is not your standard or typical values that are there. Uh, of course, there is some information that is calculated for us, like the surface and average absorption coefficient. And there's also things that we can load. For example, if this is a project where we have measurements, we can load those. We can add them as octave bands. Um, or just enter that estimated center um, value and it'll create a curve for us. We can also use these for an optimal or goal reverberation time rather than a measurement. So we can uh, keep that comparison in mind. If we open the calculator reverberation time, this is of course estimated from the current materials that we apply to the room. And this is based on the iron uh, equation. And we can see all the values by third octave band. We can use this icon here to copy these numbers out into an Excel spreadsheet or a report 
or anything like that. And then when we're going to go into calculations, uh, we can uh, tell the software to use the one we enter here instead or use the one that the software is calculated from the geometry. So that's what that switch will do. Uh, for noise, it's the same thing. We can enter um, uh, a number, a flat number, or we can go into more detail. And then um, in the switch, we can also tell it to use noise or not use noise in the calculations. And then I want to go into my calculations now. Before you do that, you might note you've got an extra loudspeaker. Yeah, I saw that earlier. I don't know. Maybe that was there with the drawings. I don't know why, but we won't use it. <laughs> so because I just deleted something, uh, I need to reacquire that. I have my two speakers. Oh, I can see that one of my seats. It's kind of floating out of the space. I didn't check that. So we have three actual seats there. And I'm going to make my audience areas visible. Now, the thing I wanted to show you here is um, this calculation module is still uh, um, developed under the older platform, the East 4 platform. So uh, if you are familiar with East 4, you might remember that it required only um, four points for audience areas. Now we have a stage audience area that has more than four points. So when I go into mapping, if I'm going to select my areas, I'm going to see that my stage has been um, divided into four sections. So uh, that might create some odd results, some edges where you don't expect edges. So just be aware of that. And then if I go to area group, I'll see that my stage has already been grouped as one. So if you have something that it ended up being triangulated into many, you can just select them from here to, to select all of it. Now, this is a temporary thing. As you know, we're developing the software uh, to eventually transfer everything into uh, this main window. So when that happens, then all those um, uh, temporary fixes will go away. So I'm going to stop here for, for this room. Um, are there any questions at this point that um, relate to, um, to this room? Um, yes, we've got a couple questions in the chat. I'll take them in just a moment. Okay. So I see three questions. Let me see. So, um, Berno asked about uh, bringing in um, your own database of absorption uh, materials. And yes, you can bring in multiple. This um, In the user's guide, there is a specified uh, location for these custom materials. Maybe you can bring up that uh, file explorer on it to show where that is. Um, and you need to put in each of the ease materials in that file. So how do you get that from an Excel uh, data sheet? Uh, for instance, in, uh, on our website, there is a 32-bit Excel application. Note that it doesn't run in 64-bit um, Excel, but uh, it does run in 32-bit uh, Excel, and it allows you to take um, a database uh, like you've got and create ease materials from that database. So um, as Anna is showing there, it's under public documents, AFMG ease, and there's a folder called custom materials. And when you open that up, um, one of the folders that you'll see in there is Teatro, that um, um, specific project that uh, we've worked on, we've done a paper on, and all of the materials in that by searching for Teatro, um, that then just shows all of the things that are in that folder. So you can divide these up by folders of projects or manufacturers, a um, wide variety of different ways. So for instance, we have a, uh, Anna has a folder for audience materials, for ceiling materials, for floor materials. And when you search for each of those keywords, then that material will show up. 
Yep. And um, the material editor here is what would allow you to create an individual material. So you can go to coefficients and then enter the coefficients, enter the, the label, the description, uh, and then save a new material. And it will be, um, it'll uh, suggest that location. So the custom materials, that's where you want to save it. Okay, the other question um, was talking about seat height, uh, actually the ear height of the listener position. So why don't you have a look at one of those audience areas? So the audience areas, uh, as you saw, I selected the face and it created an area above uh, and I can change it to, um, to any of those heights or I can enter any height. Like if I wanted this to be at two feet, then I can also enter that. Um, default is uh, <clears throat> sitting height. Uh, we also have kneeling, sitting on ground or head on the ground. So all of those uh, are options. Now, when I added the seats, um, I was trying to hover over the audience area. Uh, so it'll help me put it right there. So for example, uh, this seat um, also has that because there are slanted faces. Um, I was trying to use that to make it easier. So as you can see, it seems like for this back one, I ended up selecting the floor rather than the audience area. So it's sticking out like that. Um, so in that case, I can probably say, oh, I want to move this from there. Uh, let's say three and a half feet up or something like that. And then it'll be uh, approximately at the right height. And then the top one, uh, yeah, that seemed to be aligned with the audience area. Okay. So if we don't have any other questions about this section, uh, I'll pass it on to Bruce uh, for the next exercise. Okay, let me get my screen selected here. And find the program. There we go. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about sound systems. So um, Anna showed you um, how to insert some loudspeakers and showed you uh, a brief look at the configurator. I'll dig into it a little bit more. This is a project that was done about 20 years ago, started in ES4. Um, here in the loudspeakers that are installed in this project, I can look at them up here and it will list each of the loudspeakers that are used in this project. You can see that I've got a variety of things. Here's one that was a uh, SPK file in ES4 and I converted that to a GLL using eSpeaker Lab. Uh, that's why it says the data is not authorized as it was based on an EAW UB82, but I converted their speaker data to GLL. So when I do that, then the data is no longer authorized and it's, I, it's incumbent upon me to, to recognize whether or not that's really valid or not. And then we have a number of other loudspeakers in here, a couple of different line arrays, uh, array of some subwoofers that was uh, created by uh, myself, and then a TRX-42 um, that is a simple loudspeaker. So if we want to, uh, one of the things that we didn't look at is if I wanted to swap out a loudspeaker for another one, I could choose, um, oh, let's just say, uh, uh, passive two-way loudspeaker and by selecting this little icon over here I'm in the replace loudspeaker mode and so whenever I choose a loudspeaker it would then change that loudspeaker to the new loudspeaker that I have chosen if I want to change that back you can now see that passive two-way is added here um, if I wanted to change those back I go select the loudspeaker that it used to be, and I can switch those back. All right. So the next thing that I want to have a look at is if we need some, uh, if we need to search for some loudspeakers, perhaps I want to put in, a, oh, I don't know, Rankus Hines um, Iconics loudspeaker or one of their point source loudspeakers. 
I can filter this much like you saw in the surface materials from Ana that by simply typing in here, I'm going to uh, either select a manufacturer or in this case, we can see that I also chose uh, Rena Match because that uh, the REN appears there, as well as a couple of coherent uh, topology systems that I have created. Um, so whatever I type in here um, will give us a um, exact selection of those loudspeakers. So even though I've got a very large database loaded in here, it's relatively easy to find the loudspeakers that I want to choose. Um, so like the surface materials for each of the loudspeaker manufacturers, it gives you a little icon here that tells you how many there are um, in that list for that manufacturer. And I can go and choose any of those and then insert them or replace them. So the insert button is back here. Um, so now it says that I'm in the um, insert loudspeaker mode. All right, let's uh, press escape to get out of that mode. And I'm going to choose a loudspeaker here. So when I choose the loudspeaker, um, we can see the labels um, that Ana used. And this was uh, UB82, uh, its position, its vertical orientation, horizontal rotation. Uh, each loudspeaker has its own gain and delay that we can select here. It also has a configurator, even though it's a simple loudspeaker, in this case a point source loudspeaker, we can do a couple of things if the manufacturer has created a preset for that, perhaps some filter settings um, based on the switches on the back of the box, uh, you would be able to choose those there. We can also choose to add a filter, and I can do that in a couple of different ways. I can do that at the box level, and so this is adding a filter at the box input. Um, I can also come back and choose this loudspeaker here, and I can add a filter for the entire loudspeaker. In this case, that's essentially the same thing. Here, because it was converted from um, ease 4, it came in with some um, third octave band levels that are all set to zero, uh, so I can go ahead and delete that. Um, it did come in with um, a peak filter that I had uh, put on it. Um, no idea why I did that, but I had it in there, and that filter came through, and we can see that that filter stage is related to this loudspeaker UB4 uh, image. If I wanted to add to that, I could add another peak filter here by selecting it. I could add high pass, low pass, all pass, a uh, high shelf, and a low shelf. For each of these, as I bring it in, I can either solo that filter. Um, and in this case, if I do that, now I can see that I can adjust the frequencies here with my, with my uh, scroll wheel. Same for the gain, same for the Q factor. Um, I can bypass that individual filter, and now we see the sum of the rest of the filters that are in here. Um, or I can, um, if I turn off the bypass for all of these, then I can see um, all of these filters and their summation. Okay, next up. Um, on a show, oh, I'm going to show you a few more things. So if I choose a, a loudspeaker array here, um, here I can see that my filter stage is automatically brought in. Again, I had third octave filter on that. But also over here, Otto showed you how to adjust the angles. You can also adjust the levels if you want to do amplitude shading on the individual boxes. You can also get an overview of what's contained in that loudspeaker by going to the second icon. The third icon gives you each of the box, uh, boxes that are in there. And here we have a number of presets for the uh, high pass filter on this uh, uh, main box, as well as the ability to apply a filter like you saw before individually for each of the boxes in the system. Also has the same uh, selection of presets if the manufacturer has included them and uh, a reset for all of these filters back to the default filter for that the loudspeaker has set up. Now for each of these 
um, systems here, once we've set a series of filters, we can uh, copy and paste those uh, configurations from one array to the other, or we can save that configuration file or load that configuration file um, for each of these individual loudspeakers. The next thing that we can do is I'm going to choose all of my VIP loudspeakers back uh, here. I'm also including a lots, lots of other things. But when I do that, um, here we can see that I've got a bunch of faces selected. I have eight loudspeakers selected. I have some audience areas selected. But because I've got loudspeakers selected, I can create a processing block out of that group of loudspeakers. So for all of my VIP loudspeakers, they're going to be at a common um, delay and a common gain and probably a common set of processing filters. So I can create a processing block. And when I do that, I'm going to remove those from whatever processing block they may have been a part of and I'm going to create a new processing block here. It's called block one. When I select that, I can come back here and change uh, my label for that block. And then I can apply the delay that's necessary for those loudspeakers. Happen to know that that's 128 milliseconds. Here it shows me that I've got eight loudspeakers as part of that VIP. I've got portable subs. As I hover over these, if I select um, so that nothing is selected here. As I hover over them, you can see in the uh, main 3D view where those loudspeakers are uh, in each of these processing blocks. When I select a block, it shows me which loudspeakers are in that block, and I can remove individual loudspeakers from that block. You'll notice that that arrow has now dropped from there, and um, I now see that I have a unassigned loudspeaker and that unassigned loudspeaker can be dropped here cr to create a new block or it can be added to an existing block and as I hover over them it's going to show me which block it's going to be added to so it's very intuitive as to yes I want to add that to my VIP block when I do that now you can see that it's highlighted in that window. Now, the next thing that I want to show you is that under Windows, we do have a predefined window for sound systems, which opens up all of the various different windows that are available for sound systems. Um, at a later date, we'll be able to uh, have user defined uh, uh, window layouts, but at the moment, um, we uh, haven't received a lot of requests for that, but we've created one for sound systems in particular because they're the most complex things that we have. So a couple of things that happen here is, for instance, if I show uh, or if I select or hover over front fills, it shows me in the 3D view which ones are selected. It shows me in the table which ones are being selected by highlighting them in the table. And it also allows me to um, see which sort of uh, block they are comprised. Uh, obviously, those are part of the front fills. Here are the house mains. Here are the house subs. Shows me the gain and delay that are selected for each of these um, processing, uh, processing blocks. But it also shows me here the gain and delay for the loudspeaker itself. So we've got a gain and delay for each individual loudspeaker. We've got a gain and delay for every time we create a processing block. And we've got a gain and delay for um, all of the parts of the any place we can put a filter in a more complex uh, loudspeaker system. Okay, let's see here. Ah, and then the next thing is to have a look at um, selection sets. Um, so we have the ability to create selection sets, and Anna is going to show you how to create these selection sets um, in a few minutes. Here I've created a couple of uh, simple ones. So we've got processing blocks for the portable mains and the portable subs because they have two separate sets of processing. But I also have a selection set that then includes all four of those loudspeakers, two subs and two mains. Similar thing for the house system where we've got a central um, 
um, main array as well as the left and the right and the uh, subs uh, cardioid uh, arrays on the on the outside. So that's one way to use selection sets. Uh, second way is that when you import a DWG drawing, any layers or tags that come from SketchUp or AutoCAD will be brought in as separate selection sets, making it easy for you to choose the materials for each of those um, different types of surfaces that might be in your model. But there's also another use. We have some ceiling reflectors in here that when I look at that in my um, mapping module, those ceiling reflectors, due to how we do the automatic hiding, um, because there are two layers of reflectors, they hide all of my um, mapping for my audience areas here. So a uh, newly added feature, I'm using Ease 5.65. This will be released uh, very soon now. If I choose those ceiling reflectors and I look at the um, uh, faces table for that, I can see that each one of them has got a visibility parameter that I can now see, as well as the wall material and the area here. And if I go to my tools menu, I'm able to toggle the visibility of all of those uh, faces, 220 of them. So let's turn them off. And what that does is as long as I hover over the selection set, I can see them in the model. Uh, if I hover over individual um, um, items in my face table, let's see, let's find some hidden ones. Here we are. And as I scroll across them, uh, I have really small ones, so I can't see them. So if I select them, then I'm able to see them in the model. And you can see as I move around the model here uh, that I'm able to select and see those. So you can still select and see them. They are still active acoustically in the model. But now if I go to my um, mapping module and I acquire the data from my main module, take a little bit of time. We have quite a lot of loudspeakers and quite a lot of surfaces in this model. we will be able to see our audience areas by visibly hiding um, those faces that are in the model. They are still used as part of the simulation, as part of the calculation, but now I'm able to easily see all of my audience areas in the model. Uh, let's see. I think that that brings us to the end of that. So, questions? Ah, does Ease 5 provide calculations for subs? Um, yes and no. Um, so, right now, uh, the calculation module is still this uh, module that is based on Ease 4, and that calculation module is still limited to 100 hertz to 10 kilohertz. Uh, we are working on, right now, starting to move the direct sound field uh, over into the main program. And when we do that, we will then be able to take advantage of the full frequency range that is uh, contained in the GLL data itself. So um, not just yet, but it is a hot topic and it's the next, next big thing that we're working on. Any other questions? Okay, then I think it comes back to you, Anna. Okay, then I'm back. And for our last exercise, we're going to look uh, at some of the things that you want to do uh, when you're analyzing the acoustics of the room. Uh, so we now have an opera house here. Uh, typically, when we're going to start changing something, uh, I recommend just doing a save as. So I'm going to make sure I don't override my original one. I'm just going to override the one we did yesterday for the other webinar. 
So that's uh, version one. And uh, for visibility, I'm gonna use my cutting planes and I'm gonna cut them at zero X. And that way I can look into the um, far half of the room easily. And uh, one of the things that we do when we modify uh, the acoustics in the room is uh, modifying materials. So let's look at our acoustic parameters. Currently we have 2.58 seconds of reverberation time. And this room does have uh, a good amount of selection sets. So one of the things that we might want to do is uh, maybe all those curtains that we have, uh, we want to make them reflective uh, and ch change the reverberation that way. Uh, so let's say that they are going to be the same as the wall, which is probably this uh, gypsum. And then by changing that material, we have increased our reverberation time by a little bit. Um, and so on. Another option is if we want to add additional faces, uh, such as panels on the walls. So I'm going to use this large face here in the proscenium to add some faces to that. Uh, our polygon in face, uh, after selecting the face, allows me to go and add a face inside that face. I'm going to use some of my uh, shortcuts to make sure that things are kept kind of straight. And then now I have a hole. So let's look at the definition of the large face. It now includes a hole and it gives me the four vertices for that hole. And of course it has subtracted that area. And I also have a small face and the definition of that face. The new face is automatically assigned the default 100% reflective material. Now I can duplicate that face up into other faces. Uh, so let's go and take this duplicate from here. We want to do up in the Z, nine feet, and we want to do that four more times. So now I have five faces all in all. However, notice that I just duplicated that small face. I did not um, copy the holes. So one thing I can do is I can use those as reference to just create the holes on that wall. So I'm going to do that. Oops, that corner, the next corner, and the last one. And now my face has five holes. But the faces inside, and I'm going to show the hollowed lines, uh, those faces are now duplicated because creating the holes, remember, it creates an inside face, and I already had faces there. So I'm just going to delete those and now leave a single face in those holes. And they are all the same 100% reflective material. So one thing I can do is I'm, I'm going to multiple select all of them and I'm going to store a new selection set. New selection sets all come at the top with that underscore. I'm going to keep it so it stays at the top and I'm going to call this absorbers. And now I can use that selection anytime uh, to go and change the material for that. So maybe this is an opening 100% absorptive uh, if, if those are the balconies inside, or maybe it's a, uh, an absorber and I can apply that material. Any Anything that I add, again, it should affect my reverberation time. Now we brought it back down a little bit. Now we wanna replicate that on the opposite side. So I'm gonna go back to my cutting planes I'm going to use zero on the other side, but I'm going to use just that one. But actually, no, I'm going to show everything first because I do want to copy them into the opposite side. So I'm going to get those. I'm going to go to my duplicate and then I'm going to copy them from here to here. And then I'm going to rotate it. 
using that, that, and that. So now I have duplicate them in there and I can go to my cutting planes, just the one side. And now a different way to opening holes in a face is to select those. So I'm gonna I'm gonna use that. I'm gonna select those, go to my uh, surfaces and subtract faces from that one. So now we can see that it has uh, some holes and some of those holes that are being connected here. So it looks kind of weird, but it still gives me the same result. So those faces, they're still showing me an error because I copied them from the other side. So they are probably all in the incorrect orientation now. So now I should have them correct. And since I have them selected, I'm gonna to go to my selection set and click on this plus item. So now I have 10 in there. And because they were copied, they all have the same material as the other one. And now our vibration time came down a little bit more. So, so that's how we would add panels or change materials. Using selection sets allow us, uh, allows us to, to get different versions. For example, a before and after without having to create multiple models. Uh, for example, changing the occupancy of the audience or changing uh, different options of wall absorber material or anything like that. So these selection sets are very versatile. Now, once we have done all that and we have um, use our uh, check with our acoustic parameters what we wanted we probably want to go to run some calculations and one thing to notice is that our uh, cutting planes are not a visibility thing that would translate to the uh, mapping module the toggle visibility tool that bruce uh, showed earlier that's the one that would transfer to our mapping module. So usually we have two types of mapping. Uh, when we run a standard map, uh, what we're doing is we're creating the direct sound at every point in the map, and we're combining that with a statistical decay that comes from that calculation in our other module. So we would select the speaker, we would assign the, the size of that patch, we would uh, select if we wanted to map on areas, on seats, or even on faces. And after we check that box, we select the right items on each category that we want to use. The noise that comes here is whatever is used in our geometry module, but we can also load a different noise file for one specific calculation. And finally, we would run the calculation. I'm not going to run the map now because running it live on Zoom doesn't work very well. Um, uh, but I'm going to show you the other type of mapping that we would do, which is the aura mapping. Some of these parameters are going to be the same. We still choose a loudspeaker. We choose a patch size. So this is basically the spatial resolution uh, where we want to map the same noise. But now in calculations, we have different options. We can go from low resolution to very high resolution. And you can see that it changes from 200,000 particles up to 50 million particles for this specific room. So these numbers are calculated depending on the size of the room and the number of faces and all of that. And you can, of course, enter a user-defined number as well. And then you can also take advantage of the number of uh, processors in your computer. That means that you have more computer computing power assigned to that calculation. It also makes your computer less responsive uh, to other things. So just keep that in mind and, and see what you need to do. Finally, for advanced calculations, uh, there are a couple of options here that we're not gonna get much into. Particle loss is an alternative method. 
and diffuse rain for things like couple rooms or, or anything like that. Uh, rather than running the calculation, I'm going to load a map that I had already created. Um, I created two Aura maps. Uh, so I'm going to load them both, a low resolution and a high resolution. Okay, there we go. Um, I can hide that uh, to see the room. I can then say, okay, I want to see the map for that. So let me open the top view. And I'm going to hide my audience areas because these maps are created only on seats. So you can see the data in those seats. Uh, for Aura Maps, now we get our EDT T10 2030, and, and we can see that displayed as an echogram. Uh, we can see the difference between the high-resolution echogram and the low-resolution echogram. So the type of resolution that you choose for a specific project uh, depends on a couple of things. Uh, the first thing you want to see is to look at your echogram. And make sure that that is not very sparse uh, or very stepped, um, that it looks kind of uh, more of a smooth decay. And we can see that difference with our high resolution. The other thing you want to check is your histogram. Your histogram tells you the number of particles that arrive at every millisecond in time. And we can see that the numbers here, if you look at my cursor down here, they are typically, you know, seven or eight uh, particles per bean. We want a minimum of 10 particles per bean uh, to be able to assume that this is enough resolution. If we compare that to our high resolution, these are thousands. So uh, let me get to some of the other. Yeah, this one looks much easier to read. So for example, this is 200, down here we have 90 particles per bin, and that's kind of one of the lowest. So we know that this high resolution was enough, and for this room, I probably don't need to run a very high resolution, which is yet one more level of resolution in particles. Uh, the other check is if uh, you have repeatability. So if you run things at low resolution multiple times and you always get the same results, then it probably means that you have reached sufficient resolution. If you get very different results, then go up one more level and, and try that again. So we typically recommend that you don't need to start at a very high resolution. For a model like this, a calculation could take hours to do that, even though it's only calculated at 20 points. If you want to see a really nice map instead of uh, single seats, you want to map in entire audience areas, that's going to be almost impossible to do at a very high resolution. So, so we recommend starting low and increasing things. Uh, when you do need to decrease the resolution, I always recommend decrease, decreasing spatial resolution rather than particle resolution. Um, that way you have less points of data but they are more accurate than if you decrease particles just to get a pretty map that covers the entire audience area. So those are some of the general recommendations when you use mapping calculations. Finally, the more advanced calculation that we can do is an aura response. And this one will give you very similar uh, settings than the mapping. Um, now it's only done in listener seats and you have the same calculation uh, parameters to choose from. So our response will generate a full impulse respond, response using a ray tracing routine, and that you will be able to open in probe inside ease, or you will be able to open in, in external software such as ESRA, and, and then see and, and get any data from that. So, Anna, let's take a moment now to, uh, we've got a question, does ease calculate diffusion? Um, and so, um, diffusion is a quality indicator of scattering. Um, and it is also sometimes confused with diffraction. So, sort of be a multi-pronged uh, 
multi-part answer here. So um, in what Anna has just shown you here with Aura, Aura is considering scattering that's been applied to the surfaces. And, and why don't you open up the ease, uh, the Aura response dialogue again? Um, and go to the calculation. So under uh, the default value percentage for surfaces, uh, by default, we use an S-curve that's 10% at low frequencies, 40% at high frequencies with a 1 kilohertz crossover. Um, due to a lot of research, that has become the best average or the best default setting for that. If you have rooms that are particularly smooth or particularly highly structured, you might want to choose other values that are flat values, 10% or 80%, for instance, for the two, two ends of that. And if there is scattering information in the materials of the room, it will use that before it uses this default value. So the default value is used for rooms that don't have any scattering information in their materials or have partial information in their, in their materials. Um, and um, we do not have any metrics that show the quality of that diffusion. That's not something that we can do globally for a room that's specific to, a, to an individual surface. That diffusion calculation can be done in uh, another tool that we have called AFMG Reflex, where you can look at a 2D scatterer, and it will give you both the scatter, scattering for that surface as well as its diffusion. Now, with regard to diffraction, that's something that's happening at balcony fronts and, and anywhere that you might have openings. Um, diffraction is considered uh, from loudspeakers because it is part of the data. So the way that uh, it's recommended to measure data for loudspeakers is to measure them in such a way that the diffraction of the cabinets is included in the data. So for loudspeaker data, diffraction is considered uh, because it should be included as part of the data. For the diffraction in the room, like balcony fronts, that is on our long-term planning. Uh, we do expect to add that, but at the moment, we do not consider diffraction. So I hope that answers your question, Ron. Yeah, and, and to, to add a little bit to that, uh, keep in mind that when you consider how much scattering your surface has, uh, it can be just objects that are sitting on top of your floor that you're trying to account for that. For example, we don't draw every single seat in an audience uh, section. Uh, so adding scattering to that material uh, will be appropriate. So that's also the type of scattering that we have there. We're not saying that our carpet underneath um, has a high value of scattering, but when you consider that face in the model as a carpet with seats with people on top, then you do have considerable scattering. So keep those things in mind where you're choosing the right values to use. So somewhat related to this, why don't you go over to the results tab here. Um, the, we can generate um, a couple of different files for oralization. The typical one is binaural file, and, and we can also do B format files, which are used for um, those companies that might have an ambisonics um, or other uh, type of um, playback room that can use B format files. But if we just look at the binaural file, uh, Warren's question about can we load a captured uh, room impulse response um, into ease for oralization. So that's the ears module, which is what these the the BIR and the and the way, B format WAV files um, go to. Um, in general, we are generating a binaural impulse response file that is specific to ease, and that is used as the uh, source file for um, for the oralizations. And EARS itself is not set up for those comparisons. Typically, um, you would need to use um, another tool to do that, or you would need to convert that room impulse response to our 
uh, binary impulse response file. You can do that using our measurement tool, ISRA. Uh, it has the ability of taking um, uh, however you've measured that room impulse response file and then be able to save that as a BIR file. Um, and then that BIR file could be compared uh, against the simulated file in, in uh, using EARS. Um, typically, uh, when we're comparing um, uh, measured results versus our simulated results, we are often doing that um, using ISRA or um, other tools that are able to load in uh, room impulse response files because we're looking at the metrics that are associated with that. So we might want to be looking at any of the variety of, of metrics that are provided, for instance, are called for in ISO uh, 3382, uh, such as strength or, or uh, T10 2030, early decay time, uh, clarity, uh, definition, all of those types of things. We're typically using a software that allows us to compare the data for those uh, in addition to um, listening to the oralization. So I hope that that helps clarify, uh, Warren. Yes, um, I see there are a couple of comments in the chat as well. Um, can we get slices at different um, at different heights in the model? Um, yes. So as as I was uh, showing here, you can slice those um, in in any way at any height that you see fit, and you can slice both top and bottom if you want to look at a specific section there. And uh, we will post uh, this webinar to our YouTube channel. Um, uh, it'll take a few days for, for us to uh, do the post-processing and get it up on our YouTube channel. But yes, it'll be there. Do we have any other questions? Um, We have a full East class coming up. It's already announced on our website. And if you're interested, um, uh, you can still register. We still have a few spots. Uh, we offer a modular class, so you can sign up for just the room building uh, module, or you can add um, either sound system design, uh, room acoustics design, or both uh, to that class. Okay. If there aren't other questions, uh, Bruce, do you have any other comments? Um, no, I think we covered all the topics that we wanted to cover um, quite quickly today as compared to yesterday. Um, we did have more questions yesterday. That's okay. Um, I'll give you a moment to see if uh, if anyone thinks of any other questions that they've got. As Anna said at the beginning, we are available through our support um, um, website application. That's at support at afmg.eu. We welcome your questions. We welcome your suggestions for things that you would like to see in ES5. Those all go into a, a, a database that our developers use. Uh, the more times that people ask for similar things, the more likely that that is uh, moved up earlier in the development process. Um, we do have a question. Uh, is it valid to use gain settings to correlate 70 volt uh, speaker tappings? Yes. Um, actually, if you write to us at support, I've got a little document that, that we send out that explains how to do that depending upon how the loudspeaker has done that. Essentially, um, taps on 70 volt loudspeakers are um, uh, at 3 dB increments. Um, the zero level that all loudspeakers come in at are essentially the maximum tap setting of the loudspeaker or the maximum level um, if the tap setting um, is less than the low impedance uh, um, maximum input voltage, then you might need to do a calculation to get from what is the low impedance setting, which is what's used in Ease 5, uh, in order to calculate any of those tap settings. But it's a rather straightforward process, 20 log uh, difference in voltages, and uh, pretty, pretty straightforward to figure out what levels you should use. So um, if you transfer those uh, settings from EZVAC, 
through, um, uh, it can save as ease four, can't save as ease five yet, but um, because ease five can open ease four draw uh, um, projects, you're able to export that from ease evac and those settings would then uh, come through and be automatically set for you. So I hope that helps. And if you'd like a little more information, just ping us on support at afmg.eu and we'll send you a um, written description of all of that. Okay, any other questions? Ah, can we import an Ease GLL balloon attenuation map into Ease? Well, so the Ease GLL balloon is the data that is being used in Ease 5. So the, the uh, looking at that, is, uh, we use the GLL viewer, the free GLL viewer, in order to look at those attenuation maps, but the data is um is is what's being used in ease five so i'm not sure brian what um what you're trying to do there okay so thank you, everybody. Um, I think we're done for the day, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you uh, um, at our email address and, and uh, reach out to us uh, with any questions or any suggestions that you might have. Thank you, everybody, for your time today and for spending it with us, and uh, uh, we'll see you down the road. Thanks. Thank you all. Bye-bye.